Um, and okay, so what happens if I do that? Well, thus it doesn't work. It doesn't make sense because if I have countably many points, then this sum is just going to be infinity. So it doesn't make any sense to minimize it. Um, so here's maybe the next best thing. Um, how about if I simply try to minimize locally? So what I mean by that is I've fixed a gamma and you give me a matching of infinitely many points, the points of these two Poisson processes. I call the matching gamma minimal if for any finite set of edges, R1 to B1 up to Rn to Bm in the matching, you cannot rematch those finitely many edges and do better. So the, the sum of these gamma powers of the edge lengths of, of these, this finite set of them um, is the minimum over all possible sigma as a permutation, over all possible ways you could rematch those m things. And I want that to be true for every finite set of edges in the matching. If that's true for every finite set, then I call the whole matching gamma minimal. So it says you're trying to minimize the sum of the gamma powers of the lengths and matching is minimal if that is minimized locally. There's no finite way in which you can improve things. Okay, so this is the key definition that I want to work with in this talk. Um, so that was for gamma, a positive parameter, but you could actually take gamma negative as well. You could take a negative power. Uh, if I do that, I want to, instead of looking at the gamma power of the distance, I want to look at minus the gamma power of the distance, simply because, um, so in other words, that's the same as maximizing the sum of the pairs instead of minimizing, um, simply because um, when gamma is negative, this is a decreasing function of the distance. Um, so I'm going to take the negative of it. And I will also consider what happens. So, so in general, you could, of course, replace this function with any function of distance, like I did. So one particular case is you can replace it with the log of the distance. Um, and um, so it turns out uh, uh, taking the log is the equivalent of taking the limit as gamma goes to zero. Um, and when I say taking the limit of gamma goes to zero, I just mean the limit for finite sets of edges, uh, as in my criterion here. So if you have a finite set of edges, you consider the gamma, the gamma minimal matching of them, which is unique for a finite set of edges, then um, if you let gamma tend to zero, then it's the same as minimizing the log. Um, so sometimes I call that gamma equals zero. And you could choose other functions instead of the, the gamma power of the distance, you could choose whatever function you want, but it turns out in the sense that I won't make uh, explicit, the, these are the only scale invariant choices. Um, well, meaning that if you just take your point and you scale everything up by a factor of two, then the minimizing this function is the same thing um, for the scaled points. So, so actually these powers and logs are the only scale invariant choices. So they're natural ones to look at. Um, and um, so again, large gamma corresponds to um, Kind of fair or, or um, altruistic choices of choices of function and small gamma, especially negative gamma, corresponds to selfish or greedy choices. And in particular, there are two very two more very interesting limits you can take. You can take the limit as gamma goes to minus infinity, um, which means that. Um, so gamma equals minus infinity means we put all the emphasis on the short edges. So what it means is, uh, and um, 
you know, th this, this is a rigorous statement about what happens when you take the limit as gamma goes to minus infinity for finite sets of edges. So for this criterion here, it means that the matching you choose must lexicographically minimize the increasing ordering of the m lengths of the edges that they choose. So if you, you have m red points and m blue points, you consider all possible matchings of them, and you choose the one that minimizes the shortest edge length, and then subject to that, minimizes the second shortest edge length, and so on. So that's very selfish because it's the, the, the two points that can match closest to each other and do the best. They just do it regardless of the influence on anyone else and then the next pair get to go and so on. Um, so there's another extreme, gamma equals plus infinity, where you do exactly the opposite. You lexicographically minimize the decreasing ordering. So that means everybody is super concerned about the welfare of others. So the, um, the first priority is to make the longest edge as short as possible. So, so you will, I mean, if you like, you could think of it as, as you will make your uh, situation much worse if it will help somebody else right up to the point where you would actually make them better off than you uh, end up. So, so you're not willing to do that, but, but anything else you're willing to do. So that's uh, uh, sort of the altruistic end of the spectrum. So these cases are very interesting. Um, they can be, as I said, they can be regarded as the limits as gamma goes to minus infinity and plus infinity. And then uh, what I want to do is uh, define a gamma minimal matching, for instance, for gamma equals plus infinity to be, again, locally. So for any finite set of edges, you minimize lexicographically this list and so forth. And uh, okay. there are two questions on the chat. Yes. Uh, yes. So one of them is probably uh, quick. Uh, is the model now one dimensional or is it, are you still in RD? It's, it's still in RD, yes. Okay. Um, and the second question is a bit more complicated. So um, uh, Stefan Watson is asking, the convexity of the cost switches at gamma equals one. Do yes. you expect that the turning point between being selfish and altruistic happens there? Good. Very very interesting question. Um, we'll come to that. So yes, it turns out, I mean, there are many things we can prove and many things we can't prove, but but um, turns out that things change a lot across gamma equals one. Gamma equals one is a very important threshold, much more important than gamma equals zero. And I'll come to that in this. Uh, right, so anyway, that's the definition. And you probably want to see some pictures. So here, so of course, the pictures can only be in a finite setting. I can't draw an infinite plus and plus. But this is uh, a bunch of random, uniformly random points on a two-dimensional box. And this is maybe the, you know, the most natural case you might want to look at. This is gamma equals one. So you have random red and blue points, and you simply take the matching that minimizes the total length of all the edges. Here's what it looks like. Here you see there's a various interesting structure. I hope people can see the actual edges here. Yes, okay now. Um, and one interesting thing, by the way, is that there are no crossings. Um, the edges do not cross each other. Um, so you know, there, there are some long edges and bunches of edges over here, but on the whole, it looks kind of well behaved, I guess. Um, but one thing you might ask, and this is a key sort of question I want to ask, if you take the limit, if you imagine this is a window on an, on an infinite Poisson process, you take the minimum matching here, but then you take the uh, take the box bigger and bigger. Does this thing converge? Does it settle down? And that's very, very close to the question of, is there a one minimal matching on the whole of RD? So that's the question. Um, here's another picture. So same set of points. So that was gamma equals one. This is gamma equals minus infinity. So this is the selfish end of the spectrum. Selfish matching. Um, so here you see there are some very, very long edges. And why is that? Well, it's because there was a, just a, an unusually large number of blue points, it looks like, in the top left corner, just by random fluctuations. And everyone's just in it for themselves. So, so there aren't enough red points to go around here. So the blue points start looking further afield. But by the time they get here, all the red, point, red and blue points have paired off locally. They don't care. 
So the blue points have to look further and further and further, and eventually they find some excess of red points all the way over here. Whereas again, gamma equals one, it's all settled more equitably somehow. Um, so again, what happens when you take the infinite volume limit? Um, do these edges get uh, longer and longer? Don't we think so? Yes, yes. Um, and here's the other extreme, gamma equals plus infinity. This is the altruistic matching, where you, your first priority is to minimize the length of the longest edge and then the second longest and so on. Also very interesting and different looking. So again, that was one minus infinity and plus infinity. So uh, many questions. Um, so again, take Poisson processes and RD. Does a gamma minimal matching exist at all? And you know, this is a very important question if you, if you have this sociological model in mind. So, so society comes up with this wonderful function this deciding how much fairness is appropriate. Well, is there a solution? Can, you know, if there's no optimal solution, it's not very good. And is the solution unique? So if there are optimal matchings, but they're not unique, then well, maybe that's not so good either because if, if we have, we've come up with a matching, but I notice there's another optimal matching in which I do better and, and you don't, and you do worse maybe, then that's a source of conflict, which one should we choose? Um, also, I want to ask, is every point matched? Well, hold on a minute, what's this all about? Uh, <laughs> I, I thought matchings were meant to be perfect matchings, uh, or at least you would have thought that if you were listening to what I said. Um, so, well, I want to un I want to allow unmatched points. Um, you may say this is an unnecessary complication, in which case you don't have to don't have to include it, but uh, you can. So, um, so I want to allow partial matchings, and then I want to call a matching gamma minimal if for any finite set of edges and any finite set of unmatched points together. For, the, for this finite set of points, the matching that I have minimizes, first of all, the number of unmatched points. So every unmatched point counts for an infinite cost. And it, so it, it lexicographically minimizes the pair, number of unmatched points, and then some of the costs as before. So you see what this is saying is that it, locally, when you look at a finite set, an unmatched point is infinitely bad, it's infinitely costly, and moreover, these infinities add. So twice infinity is much worse than infinity. And also infinity plus one is slightly worse than infinity. So, so first of all, you minimize the number of unmatched points locally. Then you minimize the cost subject to that. Okay, that's the definition. And in particular, this immediately means that you cannot have both unmatched red and blue points in the whole universe at the same time. Because then if I took my finite set, if I had a unmatched red and unmatched blue, if I take my finite set to consist of those two, I could do better by matching them to each other. Um, and uh, yep. um, there is yet another question. Yep. Um, so that says that with the local optimality condition, there could be infinitely many points that are mismatched. And I'm skipping a little bit an argument about it, dimension one, but then the person said uh, that would produce arbitrarily bad matchings that are still locally optimal. Yeah, potentially. I mean, yeah, everything. Everything's uh, possible yes. at the moment. Great, uh, thanks. Yep. So that's the definition. So, um, so that's the question: Is every point matched? Um, and then moving on, if we could resolve some of these questions, uh, can we decide on a matching by a local algorithm somehow? So, um, if you've decided on this wonderful societal norm of fairness, do you have to have the government come and decide what everyone gets or, or can people just decide on the optimal matching by some set of local rules and decide what that means of course. And then you could ask about the edge lengths. I mean you have your locally optimal matching. Well how long are the actual edges? How, how often do you see these huge edges that go all the way across the screen? How common are they? So lots of questions. Um, and maybe I won't talk about this much, but um, you can also do everything for one color matching as well. You could just take a single Poisson process or set of points and just ask to match them in pairs. 
and all the definitions can be applied there as well. Um, so, um, there are some cases in which we know a fair bit, and many cases in which we know almost nothing. So, um, there, there's a, an overall message, which is maybe a little depressing, but maybe not surprising, um, that fairness makes things difficult. The, 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 the larger your gamma, the, the more fairness you demand, the harder it is to satisfy it, in the sense that maybe you don't have existence, or maybe you don't have uniqueness, and so on. So anyway, more specifically, gamma equals minus infinity, which is the um, selfish extreme. Um, you have a fairly complete picture of everything. Um, one dimension, I mean, someone asked, it, um, yeah, all these questions make sense in RD or even more generally, but it turns out one dimension is already quite challenging and quite interesting. So in one dimension, we also have a fairly complete and intricate picture, especially for two colors, actually, actually one color we know a bit less. Um, other cases, yeah, we don't know much. Um, we know existence of matchings in some cases, but not all. Um, so in particular, one open question, I mean, if you want the principal open question right away, um, the first example I showed you, two colors, two dimensions, gamma equals one. You're trying to minimize the total length. Does there exist a minimal matching? We don't know. Uh, and also another very interesting case is plus infinity, the, the altruistic case. We also don't know that. Um, right. um, so, um, yeah, case minus infinity, gamma is minus infinity, is very special. So this is, uh, so this uh, I worked on actually a long time ago, together with Hugh Mantle, Perez, and Schramm. Um, and there have been a bunch of other papers since that as well. Um, so for gamma equals minus infinity, uh, for every dimension, for one or two colors, for some processes, it turns out there is a unique minimal matching minus infinity minimal matching. Uh, so you have existence and uniqueness. And moreover, it is perfect. There are no unmatched points. Okay, so a nice situation in that sense. And it turns out, actually, this matching has another interpretation. It, it's the unique stable matching or stable marriage in, in the sense defined by Gale and Shapley in a, in a very, very famous paper, which is maybe not so well known to mathematicians, but very well known in um, computer science and economics. Um, so the, the definition as it applies to us is um, you imagine each point is an agent, each point is an individual, and it prefers to have a partner as close as possible. And we say that the matching is unstable if there exists a pair of points of opposite colors, one red and one blue, that both prefer each other over their current partner. So you have two points which could match to each other, but are not matched to each other, but would both prefer each other rather than their current partner. If you have such a pair, we call the matching unstable. And it turns out this minus infinity solution is the unique stable matching. So as I said, this is a very famous concept. The original formulation by Gale and Shapley was you have N girls and N boys who have each one has an arbitrary preference order over the, those of the opposite sex, and, and they are going to get married into N heterosexual marriages. And uh, it turns out in, in all cases, there's a stable set of N marriages. Um, and there's a beautiful algorithm for finding it. And incidentally, in this general case, it's not necessarily unique and may not exist in uh, the same-sex marriage version, which they uh, had to call the roommate problem in 1962, and felt they had to. Um, uh, so it's, this is a wonderful paper. If you, so if you take away one thing from this talk, um, if you don't know it already, go and read this 1962 paper by Gale and Chaplin. It's absolutely wonderful. And, and as I say, very, very influential. The, the uh, 2012 Nobel Prize in Economics was awarded to Roth and Shapley, 
um, largely based on uh, this work and outgrowths from it. Um, so anyway, um, in our setting, so the reason this case is tractable is that there's a very simple algorithm in our setting for constructing the stable matching. What you do is you take your random points, you simultaneously match all mutually closest red-blue pairs. You, you find every red-blue pair which are closer to each other than any other point of the opposite color. So this, this red is the closest red to this blue and vice versa. And simultaneously you match all such pairs, or match some of the pairs. Then you remove those points that you just matched from the picture, and then you repeat with the remaining points. Match all mutually closest pairs simultaneously, and you repeat this for countably many steps. And then there are some things to check here, but it turns out you end up matching everything and you get the unique stable matching. Um, and the things to check are not so difficult to check. Um, so, um, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, a lot is known about this stable matching. So, in particular, you can look at the um, the. So we have a nice unique matching now, and you can look at the the distance, the length of a typical edge. In other words, the distance from a typical red point, say, to its partner. And we know a fair amount about this. It has a power long tail, basically. So um, uh, some moments are finite and some moments are infinite. And um, in some cases, we, the alpha and beta that we have match each other, and in other cases, not so much. So one color, they're both D. Two colors, one dimension, they're both a half. And then for higher dimensions, the, the gap between the upper and lower bounds grows quite a lot. Um, in one dimension, so especially one color, one dimension, which is a very special and in some sense the simplest case, we know things much more precisely as of quite recently. Um, this is joint work with Tom Eccles and Tom Liggett. Um, we know that the tail of this uh, random variable x decays, it's asymptotic to a constant over x, and we know the constant, it's e to the two gamma, and gamma is not the gamma I've been using, but the Euler constant, 0.57, whatever it is. Um, and, and moreover, this is kind of universal. This applies not only to the Poisson process, but a whole bunch of processes. And this um, would be a good time to remember Tom Liggert, who, who as I just said, uh, is a joint author of this piece of work. Um, so um, I'm, I'm sure a name that, that needs no introduction in this uh, community. Uh, so um, sort of, and I'm sure as most people know, Tom Liggett died just a couple of weeks ago, uh, which is an absolute tragedy. So he was really uh, quite an extraordinary person and, and uh, a, a unique and extraordinary mathematician as well, um, who we very, very badly missed. Um, and he was extremely active as a mathematician until very, very recently, hence working together on this. Um, so, um, however, that's, um, I'm not going to focus on that piece of work here. Uh, I'm going to focus on other gamma. Okay, so that was gamma equals minus infinity. We can, we can the selfish end of the spectrum, we can understand um, in some detail because of this nice algorithm. So, um, so now let's talk about general gamma. And in particular, I'm going to focus on one dimension because that's where we can say some things. And this is uh, meant to be a picture of one dimension, two colors, and again it's a finite interval, so I have a bunch of random red and blue points in an interval, and the locations of the red and blue points are represented by the vertical lines because I want the points to be in the same location for a bunch of different choices of gamma. So 
uh, so, so where you see a vertical blue line, it means there's a blue point there and the line goes horizontally. And then here are seven different choices of gamma, three, two, one, and turn to it down the right hand side and then shown in black is the matching, the, the minimal matching on the interval. And so you can see things change a lot at gamma equals one. So gamma equals three, gamma equals two, somehow the matchings look rather calm and, and, and we don't have very, very long edges. This is the more fair end of the spectrum. So you know, not surprising, the fairer you are, the, the less you have long edges. Gamma equals one is kind of all different. And then down here for zero down to minus three, the, the okay, so this, the two and three, they also look very similar to each other. The two picture and the three picture are very similar. And down here, they also look very similar to each other, although they are slightly different and they have much longer edges. So something really changes at gamma equals one, it seems. Um, so, um, so yeah, so, so we can prove some of this. Um, um, but before that, um, actually, one thing um, we can prove, which you sort of need before you can get started. Um, so one dimension, one or two colors here, any gamma, every gamma minimal matching is perfect. So there are no unmatched points. And actually, similarly on the strip, uh, are across an interval. Um, so let me take a moment to, so, so, right, so, so this extra complication I gave you about unmatched points, actually it doesn't apply in one dimension. So let me take a moment to say carefully what this result says and what it doesn't say. So it's a much stronger conclusion than the following relatively easy theorem. So one thing that's very relatively easy to prove is um, in any dimension, if you have any stationary gamma minimal matching, then it's perfect, almost surely. So what does that mean? It means you have your red and blue points, which are random, and then you have some way of some algorithm you can think of, of producing a matching of them, which is gamma minimal and which is random together because the points are random, so everything's random. Uh, and the whole picture is stationary. In, in other words, invariant in distribution under translations. That's what the word stationary means. So, so if you have a situation like that, where you have red and blue points and some way of producing a minimal matching of them, such that the whole picture is translation invariant or stationary, then the matching must be perfect. Okay, that's relatively easy to prove because, um, well, but let's just think about the two color case. It, in the two color case, um, all unmatched points, if there are any, have to be the same color because as I said before, you can't have an unmatched red and an unmatched blue point simultaneously. And then it just follows that you cannot have uh, only unmatched red points, for instance, with positive probability, ju just by um, general nonsense about translation invariance and ergodic decomposition. Similarly, in the one color case, you can show you have at most um, one unmatched point, which again, you cannot have in a stationary setting. So that's a relatively standard and simple theorem. And that's not what this theorem says. This theorem says something much stronger. It says the matching doesn't have to be stationary. It says you fix the points, you fix the random points, and then you look at the set of all minimal matchings, all gamma minimal matchings. Maybe there are infinitely many of them, maybe even uncountably many of them, and none of them have any unmatched points. So it's a much, much stronger statement. And it's not so easy to prove. And in fact, I don't know whether this is true in two dimensions, for example. Okay, so I might come back to proof a bit later, but for now, that's just the statement. Um, so, so, okay, so that means we can think about one dimension without having to worry about unmatched points. Um, so as I said, we have a fairly complete picture. 
in one dimension. And before I say what it is, um, just one more observation. In one dimension, the case gamma equals one is very, very special because there are lots and lots of ties. Meaning, if you have four points like this, red, red, blue, blue, there are two possible ways you can match them with just within themselves, like this. And we'll, here we're trying to minimize the total length. And these two matchings have exactly the same total length, right? Because you just, this part gets counted once, this part gets counted once, and the bit in the middle gets counted twice. They have exactly the same total. So, so these are just equally good. Um, so one gamma equals one is very, very special, not that I mentioned. Um, so I'm also going to introduce, because it's kind of interesting to do so, gamma equals one plus and gamma equals one minus, which are the limits as gamma goes to one from above and below. And again, these limits apply in the finite setting when I define this thing. Uh, and that means so gamma equals one plus means you always break ties in this way. And one minus means you always break ties in that way. Okay, so these are also interesting cases to think about. Um, so and, uh, here's the point. Yep. And uh, sorry, um, yep. there is a qu question yep. on the chat from yep. uh, Johan Voss, who is asking, isn't there a bijection between any two countable infinite sets, which could be used for matching? If so, how can there be possibly be unmatched points? Um, well, there, of course, there are many matchings, but this is about minimal matchings. So, um, yeah, so we're talking about gamma minimal matchings. Okay. But yeah, if you have a proof that there's, there are never unmatched points, then that would be great. But we don't know how to do it in general, except in one dimension. Um, uh, yeah, so yeah, there, there are many perfect matchings with two sets of points, but we are talking about minimal ones. It is a minimal one. And what does the set of minimal ones look like? Um, right, so, okay. So let's actually say something. So here's the picture for D equals one. So um, D equals one, two colors. Uh, I can say rather precisely what the set of all gamma minimal matchings is. And of course, the answer depends on gamma. Uh, so top of the page is larger gamma, which is the more altruistic world, the fairer world. So gamma one plus or bigger, there is a matching, uh, minimal matching. And in fact, there is a precisely a countable family of them. They're indexed by k and the, the integer k actually has a meaning as well. Um, and there is no stationary choice. So there are optimal solutions, but there's no stationary solution. So that's kind of bad for your societal um, uh, uh, whatever the word is for, for, uh, for people getting on with each other. If there's no stationary matching, there's no way to choose a canonical one. Right? That, um, the way to choose one is to put your origin somewhere. <laughs> Um, so gamma equals one. Gamma equals one is kind of crazy because th you have all these ties. So it's not surprising there are uncountably many matchings and also there are uncountably many stationary matchings as well. Um, so then things get different. So gamma equals one minus, there are infinity plus two matchings. There is an infinite countable family, mk, and here it's an m subscript k, not a superscript, so these are different ones from those, and again, the k means something. There's a countable family of them, and then there are two other ones, which I call m infinity and m, in, m minus infinity, and the, the set of gamma minimal matchings is precisely these. Um, and if you want a stationary matching, then your only choices are these two, the m infinity and the m minus infinity. Um, and well, you can also take mixtures of them. You can toss a coin and say with probability one third, I'm going to take M infinity and with probability two thirds, I'm going to take M minus infinity, whatever those things are, which I'll tell you later. Um, okay, so, um, so it's a bit better. There is a stationary matching, although 
you can't really choose between m infinity and m minus infinity. And if you want a canonical choice, you, the only thing you can do is flip a coin, which well, requires global randomness. Uh, so it's not very local. Um, anyway, so that's, that's the situation. Uh, and if we're below one minus, so this is getting into selfish or greedy territory, then it's like the stable matching case. There is a unique minimal matching. And moreover, it's stationary. It has to be stationary because um, there's a unique one. So you take your points and then you take the unique minimal matching. Well, you, you've just constructed something as a translation equivariant function of the point. So, so the thing you get must be stationary. And indeed it is. Okay, so that's the situation. Um, how long do I have? Like five minutes? Or? Um, yeah, I think you've got five minutes if you want to leave 10 minutes for questions. Yeah, okay. Um, that's good. Okay, so, uh, so again, um, fairness is costly. Uh, so so if, if we're in, in sort of greedy territory where gamma is smaller than one minus, then there's just a canonical solution, there are no questions. Around one, there are some good solutions and some less good solutions. Um, uh, above one plus, well, there's no stationary solution, although there are, at least, there are some solutions. Um, all right. Um, and moreover, we can say some things about comparing the different matchings. So you remember this one dimensional picture I showed you, that the pictures above gamma equals one were all looked very similar to each other and the ones down the bottom looked very similar as well. Well, um, that's true. And oh yeah, by the way, I should have said, uh, so all, all these things I'm talking about now are uh, joint with Svante Janssen and Johan Westland. Uh, in Sweden. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, one dimension again, two colors again. Um, for gamma bigger than one plus, this was the top of the page. Actually, the matchings are all the same. So, for every gamma, for, for any two gammas, the set of matchings for this gamma is the same as the set of matchings for this gamma. So, it's actually much simpler than you might. Think. Um, and on the other hand, at the bottom of the picture, if you take any two gammas less than one minus, or even you can take one of them equal to one minus, provided you take these special matchings, then the two matchings only have finite differences. What does that mean? It means um, look at the first matching and the second matching superimposed on the set of points. That gives you a graph of degree two, a multigraph of degree two. And finite differences means that the components of this graph are all finite. So you can get from one matching to the other by making only finite changes. Okay, so in a sense, they are very similar to each other. Okay, so really, we have this phase transition around gamma equals one, if you like, uh, where the picture is very, very different on the two sides. And, and within a side, it's somewhat Similar. Uh, I mean, here it's identical, and here it's somewhat similar for different gamma. Um, right. So, um, uh, yep. Um, we can say a little bit about quantitative things. So, um, if you look in the um, selfish regime, greedy regime, where, where gamma is less than one minus, then we can say that the matching distance x, so remember this was the distance from a typical point to its partner, well it basically has infinite half moment, but only just about. So that's, that's what its tails are like. This is still in one dimension of course. Um, and on the other hand, you can construct the matching locally in the following sense. Um, 
you can express the matching, remember it's nice and unique here, you can express it as a finitary factor of the red and blue points with a coding radius L that satisfies some power law tail. What does that mean? It means you take the points and if you want to know where this red point has to get matched to in the unique minimal matching, then there is a way of looking up to some um, random but finite but unbounded distance looking at the points within that radius and then determining where you go to. So it's kind of like a stopping time. You, you look a bit further, you look a bit further, and then at some random time you know what to do. So that's true. So that's nice. The matching can be constructed locally. Uh, yeah, higher dimensions. Um, we know very little. Um, well, that's not true. So, so here's what we know. We know there exists a matching in a bunch of cases. And more, moreover, we know there exists a stationary matching. And if you know it's stationary, then you know it's perfect. So we know it in these various cases, which cover quite a lot, but not everything. Uh, and uniqueness is open in all these cases. Perfectness is open in general. These matchings are perfect, but there may be other ones that are not. Um, and even existence is open for some cases, and especially um, uh, uh, I guess this was, I meant to say D equals two here. So it's especially notable cases, like I said before, two dimensions, gamma equals one or gamma equals infinity, even existence is open. Um, so one question, is there a case where you don't have existence? So by a case, I mean a dimension and a gamma and either one or two color. So we don't know. Um, the closest I know is on the strip, you don't have existence. So you take the strip R across a finite interval. You can do everything there. And then gamma equals one, there is no on minimal two color matching. Um, and yeah, I mean, another open question. What, what, as we noted before, um, uh, one minimal matchings. Uh, in two dimensions uh, are very special. They have no crossings. So one amazing open question. I mean, if, if you take away two things from this talk, this should be the second one. Um, uh, open question, two independent Poisson processes in the plane of the same intensity. Does there exist a stationary matching where the edges don't cross if you draw them as line segments? That's open. If we drop stationarity, there is. And if we had a one minimal matching, that, then that would be such a non crossing matching, but we don't know that that exists either. Um, right. Um, yeah, so I, I think I, maybe I will wrap up here, but um, I, um, I, I'm very happy to talk about, say a few words about proofs um, of a few things if people want me to in the questions. Um, but let's. Uh, so Thanks a lot. lot. Thanks a lot for the for the very nice talk. Um, um, there was already a question on the chat that was asked mm -hmm. uh, um, around the beginning, but I said let's ask the, it at the end. So it was yeah. Siamak Tati. So Siamak, if you wanted to ask the question yourself, you could raise your hand, and I could hopefully afterwards unmute you, or you could, yeah, or tell me on the chat, and I ask the question. I can't see anyone raising their hand. Okay. Okay, so maybe I'll just ask the question. The question was about how you do the simulations because so you yes. showed an algorithm to find minimal right. uh, matching right. in one case, right? But how do you right. do it for other gammas? Right, good question. Um, so I didn't do anything very sophisticated. So, so um, there is I forget what all these algorithms are called, but but the, you know there there's, there are well-known algorithms for 
just finding a minimal matching in a bipartite graph for any costs. So that works well for gamma equals one, for instance. I mean, it's not super fast, but it's enough to do it for 10,000 points or whatever this is. Um, um, for uh, gamma equals plus infinity, um, the, the altruistic case, yeah, it's interesting. What, uh, I'll tell you what I did, and maybe someone knows a better algorithm because it's kind of an interesting question. What I did was I, um, let's see, you, 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 th there is a reasonably fast algorithm for determining whether a bipartite graph has a matching at all. So, uh, and what we want to do is first of all, so this is the altruistic case. So first of all, we want to find the longest edge and we want it to be as short as possible. That's the first priority in the altruistic matching. So if, if we order every pair of points by edge length and then sort of whittle down the list, and you can do that by interval by section, keep on cutting down, taking away the long edges until there no longer exists a matching in what's left, then you've found the longest edge. And then you take that away and do the same with the rest. So that's what I did, but um, yeah, it would be very interesting to know if there's a better way. Um, Okay, great. Um, there was also before uh, other questions are asked, there was a long discussion that basically um, about how you penalize these unmatched points. So yes. uh, do you penalize only if the unmatched points are of both colors or no, like how do you no, know? No, so no, can you, you say again? Yes. So, uh, right. so the condition is you give me a matching, a, a partial matching, perhaps with some unmatched points. And in order for it to be minimal, the condition is if I select any finite set of edges and any finite set of unmatched points, ah. then you cannot do better amongst those finite points, the ones from the edges and the unmatched ones that I chose. And do better means that your first priority is to minimize the number of unmatched points and then your second priority is to minimize the, the cost. So in particular, that implies that the whole matching cannot have an unmatched red and an unmatched blue because I could just choose that set of mm. points, no, no edges and that red and that blue, and then you'd do better by matching them. Um, and so, so, so when you do the, because when you do the local minimization for the finite set of points, it's obvious how many unmatched points there'll be, right? If, if, um, if, if you give me uh, unequal numbers of red and blue, then the number of unmatched in, in, in the minimal matching for the finite set, the, the number of unmatched points has to be exactly the excess. So if you have five red and three blue, there are going to be exactly two unmatched red. And then what you have to do is find the best two unmatched red so that the optimal costs of the other edges are as small as possible. So, so that's, that's the condition. Does that okay. make sense? And, and, and again, when you do the finite thing, every unmatched, yeah, well, I already said, every unmatched point counts for infinity. So the first task is to minimize the unmatched point and then you minimize the cost. Great, thank you. I think it's uh, very clear. Uh, there is one question by Yogesh Rarandi. So if you could raise your hand or I could try to find you on the list probably. Um, there are actually three hands raised at the moment. Three. I can't see their hand raised, right? Oh, uh, okay. So oh, yes, 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 I can. That's it. Yes. Great. Um, okay, it's, so it's, it's very nice that you're doing this, by the way. I mean, it, 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 <laughs> it, it, it's, it's extremely Badly, helpful but, for, for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Yogesh Varan, you're up. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, hi, uh, Ander. I wanted hi. to know that if you try to match ZD with Poisson, for different gammas, uh -huh. and, uh, any kind of transition as gamma goes from minus infinity, do you get better matchings? ZD to Poisson. Um, yeah, very interesting question. I mean, I would guess that the results would end up being similar, um, but uh, so similar to matching one Poisson to another Poisson. Poisson. Um, that would be my guess. Um, so 
certainly uh, I haven't I certainly I wouldn't know how to prove it offhand and uh, certainly we would know know more than we know here and maybe less but but my guess is it would look broadly the same as when you match one Poisson to an independent Poisson because you know the fluctuations come from the Poisson so if you have two of them instead of one it shouldn't okay. make any difference but but yeah I mean but there are all sorts of other interesting things you could do like so like one very interesting thing to do is you um, take a perturbed lattice so right? you take zd and then you give each point a random perturbation with some distribution so how close is that to the original zd yeah, is a, a, a vast array of possibility questions uh, and, and, and we're still struggling to do Poisson in one dimension so it's plenty of work to be done Okay. Um, so, um, since time is running out, I just want to take one more question, if that's okay. Um, so, I'm going to activate Priscilla. And there will be breakout rooms. Andres tells me there will be breakout rooms at the end. So, people who still have questions like Stephen Watson, sorry, but you can maybe ask them at the end. So, Priscilla, you're up? Yes. Hey. <laughs> yes. Hi, Ander. We miss you on the west coast of North America. Yes, um, well, we're, we're all equidistant now, though, so... Uh, okay, yes. okay. <laughs> yes, my, <laughs> my question is about the crossings. It seemed to be a very yeah. different question, and I wonder if there's some heuristics about, uh, about uh, how you find out things about either there are crossings or there, not, or there aren't. Yeah, I, I don't have much to go on. I mean, uh, I mean... So, of course, the connection is what I said here. If you have a, a one mineral matching, then there would be no crossings. Yeah, and that's why I brought it up, really, apart from it just being a very interesting question. Um, yeah, um, so, I don't know, if you, this isn't your, I mean, I, I just know very little, but, but, but um, so if we drop stationarity, so then there are tricks, and also I can do it if you allow curved edges, but that, it's just, a, it's just a gimmick, really. Um, so, um, yeah, so I guess there, there are some cheat gimmick cases where I can have no crossings, like I just said. Uh, so if you think of a construction, then there you are. Um, uh, and on the, on the other side, yeah, I, I, I don't know where to start. Uh, uh, all, I, I, all I can think about is the one minimal case really so so if if i were forced to guess i would say and this, would, this is partly wishful thinking because it would be the most interesting uh, answer as well i i would guess that there is no minimal one no no one minimal two color matching in two dimensions and there is a non-crossing stationary matching but um, but i have a very little idea how to prove either Great, so I'm afraid we're uh, just over time, uh, so it's time to stop, but uh, as I said, thank you very much for this talk, and uh, there will be questions, uh, yes, 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 there will be uh, time for questions at the end, so after Alison's talk, uh, for yep. more discussions with Ender, and I'm going to try to unmute everyone so that we give a big round of applause to Ender for the very nice talk. You should all be unmuted. <laughs> You're not a new team. No, maybe. I'm sure I managed to unmute it. Uh, hearing all oh. sorts of interesting sounds in the background. Yeah, so, ma so maybe I managed to unmute everyone in the end. Uh, great. <laughs> so, um, so maybe you can unshare.